Still a better love story than Twilight, I guess. Hey everyone, a photo of you's here, and I hope you decide, is that book worth reading of a second breakfast? Or does it deserve the fiery pits of Mount Doom? Let's decide. Thank you for not licking my armpit this time. Well, not really my armpit, I guess it's the crook of my elbow, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. The little one's back there too, you just can't see her very well. See? Dead Until Dark is the first of the Sookie Sackhouse novels written by Arthur Charlene, Charlene Harris. I believe I called her Charlene in my TBR and I apologize, but I think it's pronounced Charlene. And is published on May 1st of 2001, which ironically means that although I described this as a reverse Twilight, the opposite is true as Dead Until Dark came first, so technically Twilight would be a reverse day at Dead Until Dark. Actually, truth be told, it makes me, that I'm going to have a little conversation about the connections between Twilight and this book a little bit later, but for now, not now. For now, not at the moment. Now, Dead Until Dark created a long series known as the Sookie Stackhouse novels and was gifted the Anthony Award of, 20, of 2012. I keep saying 22. <laughs> and was nominated for a plethora of others, although if it won anything else, I could not find it personally. Perhaps most telling is that the book is the inspiration for the True Blood HBO series. Though I couldn't tell you if that series is in a, any good as I never watched it myself. It just didn't really appeal to me. But yeah, as far as background goes, that's what I got to say on it. And here's your report card. And then we move on to the cover review. Now the cover of this book is fine. I mean, it's a little, personally for me, it's a little boring, but overall, I, I, I have, I have troubled saying if it's, saying it's bad. It's got a nice stylized art, uh, you got, who is clearly Sookie on the front with the vampiric heartthrob bill right there, looking a bit more like Dracula than I think she wanted. The, the background to it is clearly, giving clear hints at how small town it really is, the burning building hits at events later on in the book. It's just overall, it's a good cover. It's fine. It, it tells you what the story's about, gives you clear hints. It doesn't even mislead you like the synopsis does. Because the synopsis would have you think that the story's mostly about the murder mystery. And it's it's not. It's just personally not to my taste. It's not a cover. I, like, ooh, that's a good cover. It's just kind of like, yeah, okay, on hindsight, that cover's pretty good for what it what it's trying to say. So with that, we'll move on to the synopsis. Now, for those of you who don't know, well, for those of you who, you know, haven't heard me say this a thousand times at this point, I read the back of this book on my TBR video, where I try to give you how the book presents itself and how what it wants you to think going in. Now, and normally, this is about where I recommend that you go check out the TBR video if you want to see that, as well as seeing anything that comes before or after this. However... For this particular case, I'm not necessarily going to say you have to, you should watch the TBR video other than to give me views, because as I mentioned earlier, the synopsis on the back doesn't really speak for the book. Yes, there is kind of a murder mystery in here, but the book 100% is just about the romance between Suki and Bill. In fact, it gets to the point that it's almost insulting how push to the side the murder mystery is it but i'll get to that later so for the quick context of this review the book for a quick context recap for this review so you understand where i'm going the book follows Suki stackhouse yes that actually is her real name and if she has a nickname it's net if it's a nickname it's never mentioned what it's a nickname for throughout the book as she falls in love with the vampire new to town known as bill compton the book mostly follows her love life as she deals with Bill, her new vampire paramour, Sam, a werewolf admirer, and very various other supernatural and non-supernatural creatures drooling all over her. Also, a murderer comes to town and targets her, so her vampire boyfriend has to protect... Have I read this before? I'm kidding, I already made the comparison. <laughs> so this book is going to be... I'm, I'm gonna go on. I'm gonna go into my review to talk about this because this book is gonna be interesting to talk about. Let, let's start with my Twilight connection that I keep hinting at. So, finding out that this book was published 
a good four years before Twilight was, made me sit back and think, I'm going to guess that Stephanie Meyer was a big fan of Dead Until Dark. Because if you strip away, uh, if, if you take this, if you describe the books by the most basic synopsis, this basically sounds like the prototype for what Twilight became. I'm not even kidding. The story is about takes place in a small town, USA. A, one of the characters of the romance is a newcomer to the town who falls in love almost instantly with someone who's already been well established in that town for years. One of the main romance elements has mind reading powers, but for some reason it doesn't work on the second half of the of the romance element. And that instinctively creates a draw between the two of them as they start hooking up, as one just can't resist going to meet the other, for really no reason. The blood of the human tastes irresistibly good to the vampire for some reason. Later on, it's revealed that someone else who's been admiring her from afar is a werewolf and creates a sort of love triangle that's going on. Only for the book itself to not really consider that, that even though the werewolf is, I personally would say, the much more emotionally resonant choice for me on the first book, I haven't read anything afterwards, so I don't know if he gets the same treatment that Jacob gets in Twilight, the Twilight series, that, that massive character assassination, because the author didn't realize, wow, when one side of the love triangle has a com healthy communicative relationship, people will tend to prefer that. Well, I gotta make him an asshole now. I'm gonna go on a rant about Twilight if I don't stop. Anyways, at one point, the, uh, the, the character is targeted by a murderer who specifically targets her because of her vampire paramour, only for the vampire's connection to her be the reason she's saved, even though she was lured somewhere with a false... Oh my god. Even though she was lured somewhere with a false phone call by someone pretending to be someone else so he could get her alone to kill her. It, really, I'm not kidding when I say this book very much reads like a prototype of Twilight. But that being said, so the, that's kind of why the, that video title is what it is. It's, I, I'm not joking when I say that. It's, it really does feel like Twilight just it, Twilight took the concept of the series and made it its own. I'm not going to scream plagiarism because at this point I'm going to talk about the differences. One thing I will give this book over Twilight is that this book is much more interesting because things at least happen. It's not a bland, boring day-by-day day following our Wonder Bed protagonist as her and the vampire Paramore hook up, instantly fall in love each with each other and talk about how they'll die without each other. That happens, don't get me wrong, but at least it takes place over the course of a few weeks <laughs> rather than, like, what was the time frame in Twilight? Like, three weeks at most? The, the, the actual killer subplot where Sookie is being targeted is actually something that takes place over the course of the book rather than a last-minute addition when... The author realized, oh wait, this is boring. I need a, I need an exciting climax. So let's, uh, let's introduce these guys. But I mean, that's about all I can say about this book. It, it's, it's prose is lacking. The story, while better than Twilight, isn't great by itself. The world building is just atrocious, and we, and we really need to talk about how Harris handled the not too subtle allegorical representation that vampires are just gay people, and just how badly that was botched. So let's start off with the, the, the lighter stuff. The prose is not very good. It has about early high school level prose, freshman or sophomore if I had to put an exact time to it, with several sentences in here that I just had to stop and reread a couple times to really get what it was actually trying to say. In fact, there's still one sentence in here that I'm, I've am i read and I still don't know what it's trying to say. Like this sentence right here, I, I still am puzzling what this is supposed to mean. I try to sound businesslike and impersonal. Though wearing shorts and a t-shirt and Nikes does not inspire professional respect. But I hoped, to com I hoped I conveyed the impression that nice people I encountered in the course of my working day could not possibly hold any threat of danger. You see what I... I there were so many ways to take that sentence. Is she talking about the people she's been... Because this is a scene where she's trying to help Bill re rebuild his house as he comes by and can't get in... in touch with the contractors because he can't go out at, during the day so is she talking about the contractors is she talking about his vampire friends that are showing up and are being awful 
is she trying to say that she has that she herself is seeing them as no danger or is she trying to put on the impression that she's no danger or it's just there's so many ways to take that sentence and none of them really make sense in the in the context of this story it, so i'm not really sure what the hell she was trying to say there i want to say the prose is terrible enough that it ruins the book but there is enough there that you have to stop and notice several times it takes brings down the immersion it brings down scenes and it brings down the immersion. Like a scene where Suki thinks she's dying and the way the prose and story is written. I don't buy for a second that this girl thinks she's dying. It sounds like she just got really buzzed and it's just sort of like, huh, this is interesting. And we're talking about someone who just got the ever-loving hell beat out of her. To the point her one of her arms is dangling and, you know, it's it just... I don't buy for a second in this scene that she's dying. Or another scene where she walks in on her dead grand grand and after the brief initial moments of panic, it, it just feels like all of a sudden she forgets about what what she just saw and is noting what her pair what her vampire is wearing and kinda of chuckling about it. And it's just kinda of one of those Like it's just one of those where you just can't stop and help uh, you know? So yeah. The story itself is nothing to write home about either. It's not terrible, but it's it's it fails to deliver on what it promises. The back would again the back would have you believe that although romance is the main driving plot, there's a great secondary story about murder and how Bill is being framed for these murders, and Suki has to either decide if he really is the one doing it or help him clear his name. No, it's not really that. Though it does get some attention, it's fairly quickly established that most of the town doesn't believe Bill is responsible for this, but they actually start blaming his friends, the ones the, the ones it mentions on the back, as the possible suspects riled up by who was obviously going to be the murderer. Because it's clear that the murderer is targeting vampire people who have attraction to vampiric people. So he he's just like, he, apart from one scene where she goes down to a vampire bar to find out who had been with her, these two people that she uh, that she kind of knew and ended up dead, there's really Suki doesn't seem to care. She doesn't seem to care once it Bill, Bill is clear of suspicion. You know, she has like I could forgive it when it was, you know, the random girl that she kind of knew in high school that ended up dead, and then it was a coworker she rarely talked to that ended up dead. But she still doesn't care even when she walks in and finds her, grand, her grandma murdered and makes the connection, as well as several other people make the connection, that Suki was the target, but because she made last-second plans and didn't come home when she planned to, that her grandma came home and ran into the killer instead, thus getting her grandmother killed. There's no guilt from, from Suki. There's no drive for her to solve this murder because not only is her life in danger... But whoever is after her killed someone very close and important to her. She just still kind of brushes it off like, well, that's over with. And it, it it's almost insulting at that point because as much as the grandma has shown to love her, how much she's shown to love her grandma, how, how close they are, she just stops caring. And yes, I get it. In real life, this would work. But this is a story we're talking about. There needs to be excitement. There needs to be, you know, interest. When when our character's just like, no, this all happened because of me. Oh, well. It doesn't, it's not good. It's not good, you know what I mean? They basically just keep, it feels like Suki and Harris just keep brushing the murder back under the rug until it absolutely can't fit in there anymore. And they're just like, fine, here it is. That, it, here's the solution. It's over. So unless you only care about the romance of this book, the, the story's going to lose you very fast. Now... On to the second biggest issue I have with this book. And that is the world building. And just how little sense everything makes when put together. Everything just kind of seems to be written as Harris needed it to be written in that moment. With very little actual thought put into the mechanics of the world and how it would actually work. Like, again, like Harris just, at, just decided how it was going to work when she reached that point in the story... Or how she decided how it was going to work, specifically how to make this part of the plot work. 
to the and while that's that latter one is perfectly fine it comes off as very immersion breaking because it often only comes up when that part of the plot shows up honestly i just made several notes here about how bad the uh world building is so i'm just gonna go through them and talk about them as they come up so the first thing that i really noted was that the premise is a bit hard to buy Suki is considered a freaking outcast for her telepathy but this is a world where two years ago vampires came out and became and gained the legal right to exist and that people accept them as vampires even if they may not like them so the idea that Suki that a lot of people don't believe Suki has mental telepathy powers even though this is a world where vampires are real and are integrating with society just doesn't make sense the time frame is a little loose as well the fact that only two years ago that vampires became legal legal citizens of the world as well as you know coming out to public view it it makes it weird that they already have like synthetic blood developed for them to drink instead of human blood or there's black market demand for their blood and to, to further off the black market demand there's another thing in this world the black market demand that doesn't quite make sense it, it um this is kind of a case of both not thinking through it for the scene to work as well as arbitrary limits that are created just to make this story work. So like bloodletting is a thing and it's it's a common enough things that someone like Suki, a small town waitress, automatically knows what it is when she thinks about it. And she finds out by reading minds that two of the people who are currently talking to the new vampire guy were in jail for bloodletting meaning that it's a crime and people have been charged for it in the past. So, one, why isn't Bill more suspicious of these characters, the rats, I'll just call them the rats, that's their nickname, when they just suddenly take an interest to him and invite him outside? Two, this conflicts with later world-building aspects showing that vampires are extremely fast and powerful. How did the rat rays get the adv advantage over Bill when they did start, you know, drawing his blood? I thought it was going to be revealed that he was letting them do it and they just took it too far. But no, it's not. Three, vampires never visit, but the rats just happen to be carrying the right amount of equipment with them at the moment they meet the first ever vampire to come to this town. That they can just, oh, let's go get him real quick. Spur of the moment. It's not a, they built up to it. It's just, there's a vampire in town and we just happen to have all this bloodletting equipment on us. It's like it was meant to be. Two, I already talked about that. How did they convince Bill to leave with them? Three, why did they, they, they did it there in plain sight, even though they almost went to jail earlier for bloodletting, but they do it in the parking lot where anyone can stumble by and see them. The parking lot and the only bar in a small town. So it doesn't make sense. There's another world building element that's brought up here because at this point, like it's, it's revealed that most of the time when people bloodlet vampires to uh, take all their blood, they just leave them out to die instead of like creating a blood farm from vampires. And so I asked the question, why do they do that? Wouldn't it make sense to have like a blood farm? Especially with how tenuous the vampire's right to exist is, right? Well, on page 19, it's revealed that it takes 20 years for a vampire's blood to re replenish after they've been practically drained dry. And it's like... Why? It just seems like a random arbitrary number to explain away why I asked that question. Rather than a legitimate reason. Like, 20 years is such an oddly specific time with no explanation. Ah, uh, let's see. Uh, repetition. I honestly don't believe that such a dying. I would not be this calm if I woke up with a guy looking at my forehead. You can't just call something... Oh. Here's another thing. Throughout the book, Suki and people in this town refer to something as the war. Uh, one of the things that brings Suki to talk with Bill a little more often is that her grandmother, part of a historical society, wants her to ask Bill if he's ever fought in the war and if he'll come speak to her about the war. It's kind of one of those, that's not something you can just do. You can't just call something the war and have people know what you're talking about. Even in a small town, it's later revealed that they're talking about the Civil War, which even makes this more egregious for me. But even in, like, no one at one any point says, wait, what war? Since Civil War, and our main character fought in the Civil War, he's a Confederate vampire, I'm pretty sure everyone already knew that, though. 
there's been so many different wars since then that just calling it the war would have everyone like, which one? You can only really call something the war when it's something that happened, when it's something that's currently happening, or it's something that just happened. Here's another thing. At one point, uh, Bill talks about how he's glad he was turned into a vampire literally just after he shaved his beard, otherwise he would have had it forever. And it doesn't quite explain why that works that way. At first I thought maybe, oh, okay, because, you know, when you turn into a vampire, all biological processes stop. So if he wouldn't have cut it because, you know, he can't, he didn't, he would never be able to grow it again. But that's proven not true because, or it, maybe it's true, but and then it conflicts with later where we watch one of his friends um, get a happy ending from a random girl that he hires. And Suki even makes a point to comment, wow, it really does work still. Hmm, I was worried about that. Does, so does he mean like he can't cut his hair at all because it's like solid iron? Like Superman has to shave in the mirror with his laser eyes level of tough? It just, the, that, that part of the world building just had me, what, what does this mean? Um, bad metaphor. Suki having to remind us every fucking time she talks that she's good at hiding her emotions. Uh, there's one point where she visits a vampire bar and she ha she says that they hang up pictures of vamps who are out and about about being vampiric and then list a group of people and Gary Oldman is considered one of them but I had to stop and I looked at the names and I realized those are all people who've played Dracula in the past so was this some were, were these actors who played Dracula or were these actors who actually are vampires um, the book never makes it clear if it's illegal for vampires to feed or be fed on. Uh, the, we, we watch where the club, the vampire club that, the vampire club that Suki goes to to try to figure out who her, who the, who the two girls that have already been killed, who they went home with and who it might have been, gets raided by the police just for existing. The book treats as it such, but... Fangbangers, fangbangers is what, what they call people who like to be fed on by the vampires, are so common that a small town had two of them for sure and knows what they are. And it's just kind of one of those cases of, is it illegal to feed on someone even if they're willing? Like, this goes back to the whole allegorical point I'll make later on, because this is clearly a one of those scenes that, oh, this is supposed to be a gay bar back in, like, 1950s. Um... He was not subtle. You can only find your grandmother murdered. The story makes no sense. How did Bill not notice? How did Gran? It was in the 4th century. What they were after Suki. Makes sense for the work that went wrong long enough. So it wasn't like a grand entrance. It was a grand entrance. Title drop. She got over the death of Gran. Grandmother fucking fast. Really? Artie, I love you. Here's my personal favorite. And this probably will stop it so this doesn't drag on too long. In this world, for some reason, New Orleans is considered the vampire mecca. Basically, this is a city that every vampire, once in their forever life, has to visit at least once because it's just that important to them. And Suki herself attributes this because of the popularity of Interview with a Vampire. And while I can get that, I have two main issues with this. First, having read Interview with a Vampire and the Vampire Lestat, New Orleans wasn't really a major setting for it. It was the setting, yes, but it's sort of like but think of it like this. It's like if I told you right now, I'm filming this with you in Yuma, Arizona. It comes up every so often when I, you know, use metaphors or, you know, describe how I'm feeling in certain moments to, to compare. And, you know, it's incredibly important when I'm talking about something like Yuma's Crime Wave, which I'm currently reading, because it's where I'm from. But for the most part, it doesn't mean anything to the review I'm putting. I don't really remember reading Interview with a Vampire and at one point, con con thinking, wow, New Orleans is such an important setting for this to be set in. It's no, it felt more like New Orleans is the setting this is set in. But the story is about this. The second part is, why would it be New Orleans? Again, I get Interview with the Vampire. It's a good book. I read it. I loved it. Wouldn't it make more sense that something like Transylvania was the vampire New Mecca? Or the vampire Mecca? Because... That's the origin of the vampire myth, according to Dracula. It's where Dracula was set, the first ever vampire and by far the most famous. 
It's just one of those... It makes much more sense that Transylvania would have been the mecca of vampires, not New Orleans. New Orleans could be like a famous vampire pit stop because of the partying, that all that. But not mecca. Not the mecca of vampires. You know what I mean? Just to be clear, what I'm saying here is not that Dracula is the first ever vampire by a literary standard. In the sense that I know that Carmilla and the vampire both came first. What I'm saying is, based on the amount of iconography we've seen so far, the uh, sort of the way they propped up the actors who have played the Dracula character as, you know, the vampires who've shown their fangs in the, in the movies on the silver screen, and just, in general, the mo most famous of the first vampires... It doesn't make sense why they would latch on to the interview with the vampire, something that came afterwards, rather than attaching to the much older, much more historic and culturally relevant myth of Dracula. That's, that's what I'm trying to say here, to, be, to clear it up. We'll move on from there, so I'm not here forever. Let's move on to what I was talking about. How vampires are used as an allegory for the LGBT crowd, and it... So doesn't work. Don't don't get me wrong. You know I've read stories before where the L, where a race of very pow not a race uh, a group of people born with supernatural abilities are being used as allegorical representations for the LGBT crowd and how society brings them down. In fact, I would even go so far as to say one of my favorite ever comic books, well one of my favorite ever comic book teams is based on this allegorical representation itself. But there's a very fundamental difference between how X-Men uses it and how this book used it. See, although X-Men and X-Men in their world have beyond human capabilities, even though they're powerful, some of them can warp reality with their strength. At the core, they're still just human. That's the whole point of the mutants. Is they're mutants. They're mutant humans. Just because they have these powers doesn't make them less human. And that was that's the point of the series often. Is that they are just as human as Captain America. However, the reason it doesn't work here is because vampires aren't human. At several points, Bill himself even tries to make that distinction clear to Sookie. He's like, he says vampires don't think like humans. They don't have the same morality. They don't... They don't treat things with the same level of gravitas. He, although there are a couple things that clearly do make sense, that clearly could work as just this is human, such as the vampires get worse when they're in a nest because they peer pressure each other into doing worse and worse acts. That's perfectly human. But we see Bill himself is not human. He doesn't react like a human at times. And he even says to Sookie, I'm not human. I don't have the same human thoughts that you do. And you need to understand that. For example, so scenes like Suki gets mad at Arlene for Arlene refusing to let Suki watch her kids because Bill's going to be there and she doesn't want them to be exposed to him being a vampire. Fall flat when it comes to an, when it comes to the metaphor of it being gay because Bill can hurt these kids. He is actually dangerous. In fact, we even see, he even admits that when he gets mad, he hurts people. And we see him do it when his friends are seemingly killed by a witch mob who burned down their house. The first thing he does is take advantage of Suki without her consent. I won't go so far and say it was, even though it kind of was. Because Suki herself doesn't see it as that, but still. And he even says that, you know, when he gets mad, when he gets in those moods, he will destroy a tree or hurt people. And again, it's one of those, it does. It falls flat because vampires are different from humans. They don't think like humans. They are not humans. And they don't operate like humans. So you can't apply human morality to them. And by attaching the allegorical representation that vampires are supposed to be LGBT people to it, you're saying people who are LGBT are not human. And you can see why I say this, met this, this metaphor does not work 
at all. Do I believe that was Charlene Harris's meaning? No, I don't. I, I, I think she was trying to do something good, but just absolutely failed in the execution to the point that it says the exact opposite of what she wanted to say. That being said, it's one of those, yeah, be careful when you go into this and you see those parallels. It really is not subtle, by the way. Again, you have a vampire bar getting raided by the police just for existing. You have several scenes that are supposed to mimic pe people's moral panic around gay people. It's just, it happens all the time. It, it's not subtle. Maybe it gets better in later books. For this book, it does not work. And because of that, I have to give this book, I have to give this book a 4 out of 10. <sighs> now this 4 out of 10 is exactly what it says when I play that little clip. I don't like this book, but I can completely see why other people will like it. I personally don't think I'll ever read this. I'm not really invested in going to read anything further on. And it is very much what I consider a trashy book. Um, I think it is kind of amusing, though, when I look at it and see, wow, Twilight kind of borrowed quite a bit from this book. And I'm not accusing Twilight of plagiarism, obviously. As they say, there's, there's no such thing as original stories anymore. Every story is one of the 11 base stories. But that being said, if the parallels are there. It's hard not to notice. And the real question of whether or not it deserves Mount Doom is a very tentative no. Again, like I said, the 4 out of 10 is very accurate for this one, that little subtitle I have. I didn't like it, but I can see why others would like it. In the same way that I don't think Twilight, Twilight, the very first Twilight, not the Twilight series, is a good book, but I guess I can see why someone might like it. I don't, I think Bill is just as controlling as Edward comes off in those books and other parallels, I know. But, you know what, people, I can see why people like this. Maybe after I watch the HBO show, I would have much more fun reading this. But apart from that, I got nothing else. Reading these bad books makes me kind of just want to sit back, go back to my hometown. You know, maybe go on a small vacation there. Really? But unfortunately, I hear that Hume is having quite the crime wave lately. I'm trying to smile, but I, as you can see, I've already started reading this book. I'm on page nine. I have two pages of notes. This one's going to be hell. But with that being said, just remember, with every book is an adventure. And every adventure is worth having. Even the bad ones.